Hi, everyone. Welcome to our webinar. I believe this is webinar number five for our ALF training series. I'm really excited today to share with you a good friend of ours, uh, Diane Hall. She's on the webinar with us. Diane, how are you? Good. How are you, today? Good. Diane is uh, president of Balanced Senior Nutrition. And uh, let me pull up her screen here so you can... There it is. Tell me if you see your PowerPoint there, Diane. I do. Okay. Uh, Diane Hall founded Balanced Senior Nutrition because of her heartfelt desire to help older adults by balancing the best possible nutritional care with a quality, independent life. Her end goal is to create a warm, home-like, and safe dining environment in which seniors can thrive. Diane and her team of long-term care specialists share this focus with their clients, assisted living facilities, and skilled nursing facilities, as well as continuing care communities through uh, some different services that you offer, Diane. Uh, you might have to explain what these all are, but clinical dietitian services, um, enhanced dining services, food safety training and certification, and you do some of your training on myoftraining.com as well. Yeah. Uh, customized menus, mock surveys, and continuing education programs. So those all sound um, like they are all needed, <laughs> those services. Especially the mock surveys, I gotta imagine that people like those. Yes, they find it very helpful uh, prior to survey, especially if you have one through one. Helpful. I'd rather have you coming through and doing a survey than uh, Aka no. or the health department. Okay. <laughs> Me too. Um, so today we're going to talk about um, holiday cooking and being safe um, during holidays, uh, right? Preparing meals for assisted living facilities. And um, so I'm just going to ask you, Diane, why is food safety important, especially around the holidays? Well, the folks we're serving, Kalei, as you know, are usually older, which means because aging and or illness, their immune system weakens and it makes them more susceptible to foodborne illness. And if that's not enough of an answer, then really think about Thanksgiving meal and all the trimmings. Cooks are preparing special foods that they might not uh, usually serve, spending a lot of time in the kitchen. And more foods are being prepared at different times and different temperatures, which means more food handling and more food holding than normal. And did you know that the top two food factors that contribute to foodborne illness are improper holding and improper food handling? So we do want to pay particular attention to them. Next. Yeah, we don't want um, somebody getting sick and having to go to the hospital over the holidays and all those things. That uh, yeah, having a nice smooth holiday season for administrators is nice. <laughs> okay, so you sold me. It's, I can see why it's important. So, um, so the the inside scoop to safe holiday cooking. Um, so how should we as administrators as um, food managers, uh, kitchen staff, how should we get ready for a holiday meal? Well, Kalei, the, the best way I can um, think to explain this to, to everyone is I've already mentioned two of the areas, food handling and food holding, um, that are going to be explained in these four core objectives of food safety. As you can see on the slide, these four core areas um, appear multiple times through the process of the meal, um, purchasing, preparing, and even serving the Thanksgiving uh, meal, paying a, special, paying a special attention to these areas will get us ready for the holiday meal. Uh, bacteria can spread, so we, we must keep things clean from our hands to our working areas to the equipment and food. Uh, we have to keep the food clean. Uh, separate raw and ready to eat foods. Uh, free bacteria can be killed, so cook uh, proper temperatures. And the fourth, uh, the bacteria grows at room temperature, so we must uh, get in the practice of chilling quickly. Next. Yeah, I you know that 
new staff in an assisted living needs the one hour training. Um, but it would be a great time to do a review, wouldn't it? Yes, I believe the state of Florida uh, requires within 30 days of hiring um, any employee that might uh, be not just prepping and cooking, but serving um, food to um, our seniors need uh, one hour training. That's correct. Yeah, review time. <laughs> okay. So, um, so one of the four core objectives you covered is uh, washing hands and surfaces, surfaces often. And uh, I think I've taken a training of yours before, and, and you mentioned something about a dirty dozen. What is that? Well, I'm going to keep you guessing for just a minute here, Clay, about the dirty dozen while I talk about the proper cleaning procedures. And we start uh, with keeping our own hands clean, don't we? And I think um, everyone has been in service and trained on proper hand washing because it is so important. We do want to take that 20 seconds, which uh, everyone has their own way of remembering 20 seconds. I remember it by singing happy birthday twice. But uh, the entire time of, of that song being sung twice, uh, you should have your hands uh, under lukewarm water, scrubbing them well, um, using um, um, soap and um, and then having um, a towel that you're going to use and throw away. And how do you feel about the, the instant hand sanitizer use? Um, they will sanitize your hands. They will not necessarily clean your hands. So if you use the sanitizer on dirty hands, you're not accomplishing much. So um, you can tell uh, if you have soiled hands, uh, that sanitizer isn't going to do you any good. You need the old-fashioned uh, washing your hands. And we have, uh, and I'll make mention just a couple of times here, um, Calais, on our website, uh, seniornutrition.net, an ebook uh, that's a one hour um, in service, and it's called Inside Scoop of Safe Holiday Cooking. And in that, we have a, it's a poster, uh, if you don't already have one, that you, um, a, a handout, so to speak, of proper hand washing. And it's really not a bad idea to have that available and accessible even if it's for families and visitors um, and the residents themselves to remind them of proper uh, washing. It's so important. That is so they can just buy it and download it, or is it like sh I mean, uh, is it shipped? Yes, if you buy the ebook one hour training, um, that ebook is loaded with different uh, forms. Some of them I'll mention throughout uh, this little span here, but one of them is the, um, a poster for hand washing if you, if you might need it. Okay, seniornutrition.net. Yes, thank you. Um, all right, so bacteria can spread throughout the kitchen and get on hands, cutting boards, knives, and countertops, even in foods. Um, yes. So, well, and you can just see these tips here. Uh, we'll go over them quickly. I hate to read, but of course, when you're handling raw meat, we'll be talking about turkey in this session, but uh, and eggs. You want to wash your hands before and after. Make sure you wash your cutting boards, your dishes, your utensils, counter and tabletops with hot soapy water or in the dish machine after preparing each food item and before you go to the next recipe. Uh, sanitize counters and cutting boards using one tablespoon of unscented bleach to one gallon of water. And this is where I'm going to um, talk about the dirty dozen. Um, quite often, I think we get in a rush and we don't wash our fruits and vegetables as the USDA is recommending. We want to even rub firm skin fruits and vegetables I mean, under running tap water with clean vegetable brush. Do this even if you're not planning on eating the skins and the rinds. Um, you need to wash all your fruits and vegetables. The Dirty Dozen Filet is also a list that's on the ebook. But it lists the most, um, the fruits and vegetables that have the most pesticides, uh, on them that you should be aware of. Yuck. I don't like that stuff. Diane, are you there? I think we lost What's Diane. Oh, are you there? I am here. Can you hear me? Yeah, I hear you now. Okay. Okay. I you, said, you said that um, the, the fruits and vegetables that have the most pesticides. 
are, are in the dirty dozen list that you just asked me about. And apples and grapes are among the 12, which I don't know about you, but I'm guilty of going in the grocery store and popping a grape in my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I haven't sweet. done that, but I might have shoved a couple in my son's mouth. Yeah. No, it's not because I'm hungry. It's just I don't want to buy these grapes if they're bitter. So, uh, oh, but I'm going I'm going to think twice before um, I eat a grape or an apple without washing it because they do make it to the top, uh, the top thirty dozen. Uh, and in the ebook, we also list uh, the cleanest um, of the, I say cleanest, the ones with the least amount of, of pesticides uh, that are least likely to be contaminated. And um, on it for our Thanksgiving dinner would be uh, sweet potatoes and sweet peas and asparagus are among the uh, clean. Well, those are things that you cook anyway, but I guess to remove the pesticides and. Yes, 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 yes. Um, always wash your fruits and vegetables. I mean, I, from what I understand too, like watermelon and cantaloupe, the process of cutting, uh, into those things starts to yeah. spread germs as well, doesn't yeah. it? Yes. But, um, believe it or not, the USDA is not recommending using any commercial, um, produce uh, washes uh, and or soap and detergent. They, they say just just uh, the tap water, uh, running water is sufficient. Okay. Okay. Uh, sounds good. Now, I have seen people, um, you know, you buy the chicken breast or you buy the turkey from the, from the, from the store and then come home and they wash it. Um, what, what about wash? Does it mean you wash the turkey as well? And rinse the turkeys? Yeah, uh, Kalei, that's a really good uh, question because um, you're right. I see so many people, um, they've heard so much about salmonella with the chicken and uh, well, and turkey, any poultry. Uh, they come right home and, and wash it. And actually, um, the USDA is recommending that we don't um, wash our poultry uh, prior to cooking, that it is in a clean state, um, that actually by attempting to put it in the sink, and washing, rin rinsing it off, you really the cross contamination uh, potential is is far greater than um, than having any kind of salmonella coming from it uh, as as purchased and in the clean package. So the answer is no. We we don't need to be rinsing or washing the turkey. Great. Okay. Well, try telling that to uh, my grandma, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right. Let's see here. So we're still on uh, wash hands Please. and surfaces, right? Don't forget the sponges and di dishcloths. And when I saw this, I I thought because we're we're sort of a smaller place, the way we're sectioned off, and we we're under the the tent for the health department, so we can use sponges and cloths in our smaller communities. Is that correct? That that's right, Clay. Um, it, it it's very confusing for folks. Um, in Florida, looking at the Department of Health uh, 6412, uh, which is the Florida Administrative Code for Food Hygiene, um, actually breaks us, the assisted living um, facilities, down to three tiers. And um, the first tier would be um, a small um, adult family home or those folks that are serving um up to five residents. Um, and yes, you have to have clean, wholesome food. It has to be safe for human consumption. And there are some um, food codes that we need to follow. However, um, in their wisdom, they've decided the tier one would be the least restrictive. The tier two adds a little bit more of the food code um, onto it, which would be for those assisted living facilities that are serving um, six to 10 residents. And then of course, tier three are for those larger residents that are serving um, 11 and more. Uh, tier After tier one, the party is over. Um, anyone serving six and over, a good chunk of the food code kicks in and they are required to follow it, which means no sponges, no cloths, and um, a matter of sanitizing um, everything, which is not necessarily um, required in the smaller ALs. It can be very confusing, but um, so most. Over, you cannot. Pardon? 
yes, for, for actually for six and over, you cannot use plunges in the water. Okay. Uh, you would be using the three compartment sinks, uh, which has the you know the wash, rinse, and sanitizing for your pots and pans, and then you'd be using a commercial dishwasher um, for the rest of them. So, uh, so quickly, if you are uh, small and um, serving five or less, then you want to clean your sponges and dishcloths daily uh, into the dishwasher, uh, maybe even more uh, on Thanksgiving Day because you're going to start early in the morning and perhaps be working until um, dinner time, which is um, um, uh, necessary to clean more than once. You can also microwave, take your sponge. I always dampen it. I put a little drop of soap on it and then you microwave for one minute and that gets the sponge hot enough where it's killing the bacteria. Um, but for goodness sake, when um, they start to uh, have an odor to them, you just throw them away. <laughs> Something clean. Yeah. Um, you can store your sponges and cloths in dry uh, locations. Uh, don't use sponges on countertops. It's too too easy to spread. They really recommend using paper towels for your kitchen surfaces, especially if you're working with the turkey and which is poultry uh, potential for salmonella. They want you to use paper towels uh, or disinfectant wipes for your countertops. Okay. Alrighty. So we're on to the next section, which is separate. Don't cross contaminate. Correct. Um, and that is one of the four objectives of food safety to keep from contaminating food. We want to separate as much as possible. There's many ways to contaminate food um, for the holiday meal, uh, beginning before the food even enters into your house, uh, and then it increases the more the food is handled during the prep uh, preparation of the uh, Thanksgiving meal and can become quite challenging. Next. Okay, so cross-contamination is how bacteria spreads from the grocery store to serving the dinner table. Um, what do you mean by grocery store? Um, you mean we can contaminate uh, from the grocery store? Yes, um, watch as the bag boy or girl places items in the grocery store. See how well they have been trained. See if they're putting raw foods or ready to eat foods. That's a no no. Um, that's one way that you, you haven't even gotten home yet. And if you have juices that are running, um, so you've got some raw meat and they decided to put your, your milk carton or, or any, any ready to eat surface that, that might touch that raw juice, um, you've already contaminated, um, right then. So, uh, yes, yeah, you certainly can, um, have uh, contamination rate as they're bagging your grocery uh, and also looking at the list here and the, the bullets um, this is telling you to separate out raw turkey and eggs from fresh fruits and vegetables not only just in your grocery bag but keep, you know, keep it in mind in your refrigerator as well uh, you, you want to use one cutting board for fresh produce and a separate one for raw meat you never um, place cooked foods uh, on a plate that has been previously used um, for holding the raw um, turkey or raw food. When handling raw turkey, keep it and its juices away from the ready-to-eat foods. Um, don't let cooked casseroles and dinner rolls come in contact with raw turkey and its juices. Um, this is kind of a, a big one um, that we struggle with sometimes, and that's when we're serving our uh, seniors. We don't want to be touching the food contact surfaces, such as the plates and the bowls and the inside of the glasses as we're handing them to them. And again, um, we go into this in a little bit more detail <clears throat> in the ebook, um, Inside Scoop Safe Holiday Cooking, uh, with illustrations that are perfect for staff training on um, how to and how not to properly uh, handle um, and techniques on these serving. So you want to hold the cup properly when you're handing over those yeah. things. Yeah. Okay. So you can see separating and, and, and the, the whole cross contamination. I mean, it's from the grocery store to the dinner table. You can, you can see how easy it is. Um, you, can, <clears throat> you can make errors. Yeah. Well, some, I think some people were just never taught that. I mean, maybe it's, it's not a proper food service business. I mean, like a, in a restaurant, but these are techniques that that uh, probably should be taught. Yeah. Correct. Yes. 
<laughs> even you know dirty dishes and then use using your hands to pick up other dishes you're it's just yes I, I've seen stuff. Yeah. all right so let's move on here um next section is cook to proper temperatures correct are you on um the this slide will be, nine okay and this is our slide that uh is going to lead us into the That's next right. phase of the food yeah. floor Okay, so uh, food is, is safely cooked when it reaches a high enough internal temperature to kill the harmful bacteria that cause foodborne illnesses. And yes. um, mm -hmm. well, I just since we're talking about turkey, I was just wondering, thought I heard something about the um, temperature for turkey being uh, the, the proper temperature changing. Oh my, that's another confusing thing. Um, it's been years, I say years, maybe eight eight years ago, uh, maybe even longer. Um, they did at one time, you are correct, Clay, uh, have us cook all poultry, including the turkey, to 180. They lowered that to 165. And some folks um, just are, you know, still old school and, and, and might think it needs to be 180. But truly, a turkey, especially the breast, can dry out so quickly that... Um, if you don't have to cook it to 180, uh, 165 is safe. So um, any, any new thermometers would probably say 165, but yes. any okay, older thermometers might say 180. Right. That means that, it, hey, if you've got an 8 to 10-year-old thermometer, you might want to get a new one anyway, right? <laughs> right. Well, but, you know, sometimes people hold on to those things. I know. And and that's for another section. That's for another time, okay. Kalei. We about calibrating thermometers if you've kept them and make sure that they are accurate. But uh, I, I like that we're even talking about thermometers because if I'm in a, a, a room full of folks and ask how many really use thermometers, unfortunately, um, sometimes I don't get very many hands uh, up. Uh, you, you've got to have not only a thermometer that you know you're you know having your your refrigerator nice and, and chilled. But you have to have food thermometers, especially for these holiday meals. You're cooking usually kind of a large, um, a large, uh, either a large casseroles. The, the turkey is rather large. How do you really know the temperature that's in the core of of it? So um, I see no other way than to get yourself a thermometer. Check the internal temperature in the innermost part of the thigh and the wing, in the thickest part of the breast for the turkey. Um, and again, you want 165. Make sure there's no cold spots in food where bacteria can survive in cooking in a microwave. You want to make sure that you cover and stir and rotate uh, if you're using a microwave, which some of us have to. When you've got a couple of casseroles and a big old turkey, sometimes they all don't fit in the um, oven, so you are using them for microwave. Um, and you want to make sure that the turkey gravy is brought to a boil, especially when you're reheating it. So, okay? Yeah, if you're making it from scratch, that. Uh... Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. All right. So now we move on to the next uh, section is refrigerate promptly. Refrigerate promptly. And yeah. uh, so bacteria spread fastest at temperatures between 40 degrees and 140 degrees. So chilling food properly is one of the most effective ways to reduce the risk of food illness. I guess that's a fact. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We're going to. And we're going to take the last five minutes. It's probably the biggest chunk, so I'll have to go through it kind of fast. But um, it, it, to chill is one of the four core objectives of food safety. And um, to chill means to refrigerate foods quickly because cold temperatures will slow down harmful bacteria. Do not overstuff your refrigerator. Cold air must circulate. The colder you keep it, the better. The more consistently you keep it low, the better. Your food actually will stay fresher uh, the colder it is. Uh, I always bring mine right to the point of I don't want to freeze anything, but uh, I usually keep mine around 36. Um, use appliance thermometers to be sure the temperature is consistent. So, again, you've got to have a thermometer in your refrigerator to make sure that you're doing this simple step of keeping um, the refrigerator at 40 below and the freezer at zero. Uh, refrigerate that re, uh, turkey as soon as possible. Diane, I think we lost you there. Are you? Uh... Tom says that one J 
day for every four to five pounds. And most of us buy at least 12 to 15. So we would say that it would take at least two, three, possibly four days ahead in the refrigerator to thaw your turkey. That is okay, by so far. You sort of broke up, but we heard the ending there. So it says refrigerate one day for every four to five pounds. Correct. Okay, that's how. If you have a question, I guess you said you lower it down to 36, but if you knew you were going to put in like hot leftovers or a big pot of soup yeah. to cool down Break you might down. want to lower it ahead of time yes yes that's a very good i wish i would have put that in my powerpoint there <laughs> and i do that i do when i'm expecting company and i know that my my refrigerator is going to be cooler than normal i i bring it down yes i do so that's good thank you okay i guess you could all could you do something ahead of time as well like have some sort of ice bath or i guess you could uh, probably do some sort of blast Sure, sure. Um, and we, you know, they. I think the next slide might talk about oh, like. I'm right ahead. Okay. You know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, left. Yeah. So. It's uh, a good. It's a good want... topic. So leftovers and refrigerate food promptly. Okay. Let's go ahead, Diane. Sorry. Okay, that's all right. Um, but we. Um, this is talking about dividing the leftovers. I think that's what you were into shallow pans or smaller pieces. I mean, if you've got a whole lot of turkey left over, uh, of course you're going to want to break that down. You, you only you only have two hours to get to get the inside of that turkey or the inside of that soup or uh, whatever larger container that you have of leftover. You have two hours to get that to 70. And uh, quite often, if you keep it covered and in a large container, there's no way you're going to accomplish that. So you do have to separate out. Don't, uh, I remember from one of your trainings, you said that some types of bacteria can actually grow in the refrigerator, even regardless of this 70 yeah. degree. Okay. That's the, that's the scary part about all of this. Uh, Listeria is a uh, bacteria that actually slowly grows um, on food that is stored uh, at 40 and below. So uh, that's why uh, I have to keep telling my husband food doesn't last forever in that refrigerator. Um, after <laughs> typically uh, three to four days, you really, really need to get rid of it. Mm -hmm. So I didn't even. I yeah. I mean, I just kind of get sick of leftovers by then. But so there that's a go. good defense mechanism I built. <laughs> to... Yeah. Yeah. Very good. All right. So I'm sorry. You were saying, okay. So inside of. Inside temperature of the turkey must be 70 degrees, two hours dropping. Divide leftovers and shallow containers. Yeah, I'm sorry to talk over you, Kelly, but uh, the 70 degrees, again, points out that unless you have a food thermometer, you, 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 you just can't, you can't practice this. You have no idea what the inside of that turkey is uh, or, a, you know, big pot of soup unless you, unless you use a thermometer. So can't say enough about that. So before okay. thank you. Go, go to go. Okay. So you can freeze gravy as well. For, um, for things. You should eat it within two days. Um, are you there again, Diane? I am. Can you okay. hear me? Yep. Yeah, I hear you now. Okay, so um, you have a happy and healthy Thanksgiving filled with merry, uh, many blessings. I just want to say that for a copy of, of this presentation, um, the PowerPoint, you can find it on Diane's website, which is seniornutrition.net slash resources. We'll also have a link to it, um, link to her site and this page on her website on the YouTube channel and also within the training. I'll, I'll give you a link to that as well. Um, Diane, briefly, I mean, let's talk about this inside scoop on safe holiday cooking. I guess I've already, I think, mentioned it a couple of times, Kalei, and it's just more information and resources, lots of resources regarding um, food handling, um, in particular for larger holiday meals. You'll love it because it's uh, it's, it's really fun learning. It, it actually has two fictitious characters, uh, Dottie and Mary, that are asking questions to the dining manager, Max, and uh, it's kind of a creative way to learn some of this, even though I'm a dietitian, I, I, I admit it can be a little dry. So I, I think it's kind of a fun way uh, to, to learn. So if you need the one CEU and are interested in more, um, there's the there's the ebook for you. And then if you flip to the next slide real quick, because we're out of time here, I just make a plug into my manual. 
it's a whopping uh, word six that you use. It's for both continuing care communities, which is long-term care SNFs and a uh, assisted living. And it really overall is just a, um, it's also a fun way, same for uh, fictional characters, Mary and Dottie, and they explain the process that's necessary when someone makes a risky decision about our meals. Um, I've been involved since 1982, and I've seen many, many people uh, placed on thickened liquids and puree with a doctor's order that they don't want, and it kind of leaves the provider um, uh, not knowing what to do and how to do it properly. So this book goes into that as well as um, a lot of forms for survey compliance. So, yeah, uh, as an assisted living facility administrator, you are caught between that, the resident's wishes and the doctor's order. It's hard. It's very hard because everyone wants and should be honoring the resident's choice. Um, so we just have to make sure that we balance, which is my name, balance, um, what's what's quality of life versus quality of care for, for these people. So. Well, Diane, that, I have yeah. so much. Thank you so much. I've been trying to get you pinned down to do one of these webinars for a long time. And I, it's because you're a wealth of knowledge. And I know that the, our viewers are really going to appreciate it. So thank yeah. you. And um, hopefully we can do this more often. Thank you for having me, Kalei. Okay, thank you. Let me stop this uh, sharing. Thanks, guys. Bye.